Hello YouTube Frongs, welcome back to an updated complete guide. This time covering the return of our favorite Pyro Walnut with some of the most adorable idol animations, Wu Tong. My pronunciation of her name may vary slightly throughout the guide depending on my energy levels. As usual, we'll be taking a look at 3 star, 4 star, 5 star weapon choices, going over her talents and optimizing her charge spam playstyle, explaining her constellations and the value of her C1, artifact choices, team compositions, and showcasing her in the current abyss. With regards to artifact choices, we'll be covering the Shimanawa set and explaining the pros and cons to the set's energy sacrifice for her. All right, let's get into it. Everything will be timestamped for your convenience, so feel free to skip around for what you need. But before we move on, I'd like to introduce you guys to the sponsor of this video, Razor Gold. This one is super cool and especially helpful for those of us who, you know, occasionally spend a few dollars here and there on Genshin and other games. Razer Gold is the unified digital wallet for gamers worldwide. Every time you use Razer Gold, you earn Razer Silver, which you can redeem for Razer hardware and peripherals like the Razer Viper Ultimate Mouse, the Razer Kishi for you mobile gamers, as well as things like Genshin Impact Genesis Crystals, PlayStation gift cards, or even Crunchyroll Premium. Razer Gold is available in over 42,000 games and entertainment titles. Partner with massive titles such as Genshin, League of Legends, Valorant, Minecraft, and more. There's plenty of Razer Silver rewards to choose from, and there's options for gamers on all types of devices. You can purchase Razer Gold using a plentiful amount of payment methods, including PayPal, so anyone can take advantage of these great rewards and improve their gaming experiences, no matter what type of gamer you are. Start to get more bang for your buck by using my Razer Gold link in the description below. Use code SCIENCE for 20% back on any Genshin Impact purchase using Razer Gold, valid in the US only. The amount will be instantly returned to your Razer Gold wallet once you complete your purchase. And back to the video. Alright, so here's my Hutal. Unlike my usual guides, since this is a rerun, my Hutal stats are very high investment. She's level 90 out of 90, constellation 6 with 8 11 11 talents. Still hoping for a constellation toggle so I can revert to C0, please. So the damage output you'll be seeing is much higher than a base invested level 80, constellation 0, level 6 talent, Hutal. So please focus on the comparison between weapons instead of the absolute damage. We'll be running my best 4-piece Crimson Witch set with standard HP scaling DPS main stats, HP percent, power damage, and crit rate or crit damage mask. In the artifact section, we'll go over the difference between elemental mastery timepiece and HP timepiece so you guys can visualize the difference. Brief pause here for my current artifacts. I do have fairly well invested pieces, so the stats you'll see are indicative of a high-end Huta build. So, I'll be swamping to a crit damage mask for White Tassel, a Deathmatch, and Jade Spear to balance her crit ratios. And here's a glimpse at her general stats, running a non-crit weapon. This is a Dragon's Bane weapon. 63 crit, 189 crit damage. Lower crit rate than I personally like, but still good enough to demo with, with a little bit of recharge. If you guys want to see, by the way, uh, the difference between a Dragon's Bane R590 versus a Staff of Homa, and what the stats look like, looks like this. She reaches up to 40,000 HP, her attack is 1.7k, and her crit damage is now 250%. Okay, moving on to her talents. So Hu Tao is currently the only character whose kit sacrifices HP in exchange for stats. The sacrifice is based on her current HP, so she'll never fall below 0 HP. For newer players, however, this may feel a bit different getting used to since you're incentivized to keep her on life support to maximize her DPS. But don't worry, because her base stats and build path more than make up for this, what life support means for Hu Tao actually looks like a full HP bar for other characters. So let's begin with her elemental skill. This is the core of her kit that converts her HP into attack. 30% of her current HP is sacrificed and her attack is increased proportionally to her max HP percent. This state is called Pomerita Papilio, or PP for short. Given a 30k HP Hutal, the attack increase that you should expect is, while level 6, it's 5.06% max HP, which is 1,518 attack, and at level 11, which is what I currently have, 6.56% max HP is about 1,968 attack. Now, there is a caveat here, and this is often overlooked. The attack increase from the skill activation cannot exceed 400% of her base attack. As a reminder, the base attack is the white number here. I'll demonstrate my 35k HP Huta with a level 1 1 star weapon. You can see that even though her HP is 35k, she was only able to gain 520 attack due to her base attack being so low. Now, here's what that looks like with the level 80 weapon. So, even though she's HP based, weapon base attack still matters. To ensure you reach the gain threshold of a 30,000 HP Hutao at level 6, make sure your Hutao has at least 380 base attack, including her base of up to 106. So the higher HP and the higher level her elemental skill is, the higher base attack that she'll need to gain all the conversion. This is mostly not a problem until you reach like 40,000 HP and level 11 skill. And then here we can tie in her Ascension 4 passive called Sanguine Rouge. 
When Hu Tao is equal or below 50% HP, she gains 33% power damage bonus. Pretty straightforward. This also shows up in the attributes page, so it's very clear when it's active. Here's what it looks like below 50% HP and above 50% HP. So, above 50% HP, we can see it's 61.6 pyro, and then below 50%, we can see it's 94.6 pyro. This increase is the main reason why Hu Tao players are incentivized to keep her on life support. Combined with her signature, Staff of Home is passive, and you've got a perfect synergy for life support Hu Tao maximized DPS. Okay, and for the rest of her elemental skill. So, during her 9 second PP state, her attacks are pyro infused, and her charge attacks inflict a bleed called Blood Blossom that ticks every 4 seconds. This Blood Blossom damage is significant, can crit, and can react. With a cooldown of 16 seconds, the downtime between rotations rests at about 7 seconds. This downtime is very short and perfect for setting up her team supports. Be wary, however, that her PP state expires if she swaps out of the battlefield, so you're incentivized to prepare her supports prior to her entering the field. This also brings up her Ascension 1 passive. When her PP state ends, all party members, excluding herself, have a 12% crit rate increase for 8 seconds. A little extra team buff for that short duration where her skill is on cooldown. Alright, moving on to her normal attack. These are standard DPS polearm multipliers. We'll be narrowing down on 3 multipliers for her DPS rotations though, which will become clear why after the playstyle section. N1, N2, and her charge multiplier. Okay, and finally her burst. So, with her elemental skill constantly stealing her HP, her burst is where she can vampire it back up. This is her singular ghost slapping source of AoE that regenerates a percentage of HP per enemy hit up to 5 times. Her charge attack can technically hit multiple targets, but her burst is through AoE. Here's what that looks like only hitting 2 enemies versus 5 enemies. So we can see that both the damage and the healing is maximized under 50% HP. The HP regeneration you see is per enemy. So at level 11, she can regen up to 53 to 71% of her HP back. At level 6, this is 41 to 55%. So for talent priority, normal attack is highest priority for the raw multiplier increase to her charge attack spam. Then her skill for the increased HP conversion. Uh, I would generally recommend keeping normal attack and elemental skill at the same level, but prioritize normal attack first. And then finally, Burst is her major source of AoE. So all the skills are worth to level 8 and beyond though, so don't hold back. She's definitely a character where every slight increase in investment shows. Alright, let's jump into the most intensive part of the guide. How to play her. Courtesy to the Kaching mains for educating me on the mastery behind Hu Tao. She's one of those characters that has a spectrum of play, varying from low input and autopilot to high APM and reactive inputs. The reason behind this is due to how quickly her charge attack can be cancelled. At the highest skill ceiling, she's definitely one of the most technically challenging characters to master. So whether or not you just want to have fun and play autopilot or become an expert in Hu Tao mechanics, this section will have a playstyle for you and cover the progressive playstyles of difficulty while taking into account C0 versus C1 differences. For those like me who have boomer hands, we can settle on a middle ground as we try to master the more difficult rotations. For all of these demonstrations, my Hu Tao will be running a 1 star level 1 weapon so I don't slay the crowd red is mine too quickly. So to begin, the simplest rotation, N1C or N1 into charge attack. All that is required is a hold left click and directional keys to retarget. No dash cancelling or jump cancelling needed. During the duration of her PP state, she can achieve up to 9 combos of this. This demo shows me hitting 8.5 combos before her state expires. Now, adding in jump cancels or dash cancels. For Z0 gamers, weaving in jump cancelling allows Hu Tao to quickly end the animation of her charge attack to begin another N1C combo without sacrificing too much of her stamina bar. This rotation can be seen as N1CJ. This rotation generally achieves the same number of combos, 9, as N1C, with the benefit of controlling Hu Tao's position instead of having her fly off everywhere. All that is required in this rotation is the same left click hold into a jump at the beginning of the charge animation. From there, it's muscle memory building. Now, for my C1 gamers, weaving in dash cancels instead of jump cancels allows you to improve the number of combos during PP state, as well as introduce iframes and natural repositioning. This is only possible due to the stamina saved from C1 and incorporating it into the dash. This rotation can be seen as N1CD. The rotation is noticeably faster than jump cancelling and can achieve up to 12 combos. So as you can see, my boomer hands can't quite hit 12 combos in a row, but the effectiveness of the dash cancelling hopefully is clear. With practice, I'm sure you'll be able to execute this better than me. However, the better you become at dash cancelling, you may notice that sometimes you'll hit what's called dash cooldown. After two consecutive dashes, you can't dash for a bit. Try spamming dash and you'll see what I'm talking about. If this starts to occur during your combos, in order to bypass this, you may need to add an N1C jump cancel every third dash cancel. The inputs get crazy, I know, but you can do it. If you really want to become a Hutal master, then this training arc may be necessary. Okay, and now we get to the most difficult and APM intensive combos, the N2 combos. 
Instead of N1C with one normal into a charge attack, this weaves into two normal attacks before the charge attack. The time loss is very small, and the combo adds an extra normal multiplier to the mix. N2C deals 20% more damage than N1C does. These rotations, instead of the left click hold, require a tap left click twice into a left click hold. For C0 gamers, we have N2C jump cancel. During PP state, on average, 8 combos can be achieved with this method. With near frame perfect animation cancelling, 9 combos can be achieved, maximizing the DPS gain to 20%. That's really hard though. Execution definitely requires getting used to, but once you do, I think it's pretty satisfying. And then finally, for my C1 gamers, we have N2C dash cancel. And if you have C1 and want to reach for the stars, I would recommend giving this a go. Here's what my scuffed attempt looks like. N2 allows just enough spacing so that you don't need to worry about dash cooldown, which means essentially you can do N2 CD permanently through your entire rotation. On perfect execution, 12 combos can be achieved during PP state, which matches N1 CD's number of combos. But in most cases, and in practical use scenarios, this will average out to be 10 combos. You can also see that the duration of PP state lasted for 11 seconds here instead of the usual 9 second cooldown. This is due to hit lag extension on melee characters and assists further with squeezing out a tiny bit more DPS. And those are the combos. No matter how much investment you're willing to give her playstyle, there's a rotation that hopefully fits your comfort. All of these demos were done by me. Hopefully they weren't too shabby because I know they're not the best. With a little practice, you and I can both be a little bit better at playing cool time. Okay, time for weapon comparisons. Here is what we'll be comparing. Three star weapons. White Tassel. Budget F2P option providing crit rate secondary for easy building. Four star weapons. Prototype Star Glitter. A craftable option. Ketane Cross is fine for an Elemental Mastery Reverse Raverize, but I chose not to craft it since the passive makes no sense for her. Base comparison for this weapon versus the White Tassel. Blacklift, Star Glitter option, standard crit damage weapon. Deathmatch, Battle Pass Guarantee, high value crit rate weapon. Dragon's Bane, Vaporize weapon, Xingqiu needed. Lithic R5, it's a unique gacha weapon and revolves around a Liyue team with Xingqiu and Zhongli most of the time. For the 5 star weapons, we have... Scoured Spine at 80, Last Resort 5 star, Recharge Secondary essentially is wasted, but good base attack, slight crit rate and attack speed, and a mediocre passive proc. Jade Spear, stack based weapon, needs on-field hits to maximize power. Staff of Homa, signature, no explanation needed. So for my 5 star weapons, I did manage to get another R1 Homa from the previous poll video, so we can test both R180 Homa and R590 Homa in this video to show you guys the power difference. For my artifacts, I'm going to be running 4 Crimson Witch for all demos, HP% percent, power damage, and crit rate main stat. Switching to a crit damage main stat here for certain weapons like White Tassel, Deathmatch, and Jade Spear. Also the stats if you need to. These tests will be done with Hu Cao under 50% HP since most of the time that's where her health pool will reside during DPS phases. This is to gain the 33% power damage bonus from her Ascension 4 passive. We'll be paying attention to her N1C, N2C burst, and to compare Vaporize damage, we'll have her Vaporize charge attack damage. We'll also be taking note of the Blood Blossom damage, but note that mine will be enhanced by C2. And a friendly reminder, I will be using crit rate food to make testing easier for myself. The damage numbers will not be inflated, this is purely to save time. All final damage numbers will be compared as fully crit numbers. Alright, you guys know where I'm headed to the Cryo Regis Vine. All right, for three-star weapons, we have the White Tassel as a singular weapon here. Budget three-star option providing crit rate for easy building. Normal attack increase is also a plus. So, two-star White Tassel is a great option for early game players starting out. Crit rate secondary also matches very well with her crit damage ascension stat to provide early gamers with that early stat boost. Moving on to 4 star weapons, beginning with the prototype star glitter. Definitely a last resort option, purely here to compare against the 3 star white tassel so you guys can see how much the difference is. Okay, on to more fitting weapons. Blackcliff R180 with no passive active since we're against the crowd is fine. Next, Deathmatch at R180. Passive is naturally active here. Stats are very similar to Blackcliff. We have the crit rate descendant stat, so I'll be using a crit damage mass to compensate for it. You'll notice that for most of these weapons, uh, the crit rate and crit damage will be relatively similar.
next dragon's bane at r580 so this is the sheen chill requirement weapon the thing to look here for is the vaporize damage because of the elemental mastery on the secondary stat And lastly, and more uniquely, the Lithic Spear. For this weapon, we're going to have three Liyue party members, including Kutal, so adding Zhongli and Qingqiu. I'll be switching to a crit damage mask for this weapon as well, since the passive provides 21 crit rate at R5 with three party members. So, those are the 4-star weapons. The craftable prototype honestly isn't much better than the White Tassel. Also, it doesn't provide any crit set either, but I recommend if you're early to use the White Tassel. Between the Black Cliff and the Deathmatch, Black Cliff, even with 0 stacks, still outputted more damage. But don't forget that the Deathmatch's crit rate is significantly higher, so they'll be more consistent. That being said, Black Cliff with 2 or more stacks and higher refine will be able to match that. In my personal opinion though, I would still prefer to use Deathmatch here if you have the Battle Pass due to the universal passive and the 33.5 crit rate. Dragon's Bane. So this is definitely a massive power spike, especially if running Vaporize with Ching Chou. Unfortunately, the value does fall off if not running a Vaporize composition and if you aren't able to get those Vaporizes on your charge attacks. And finally, Lithic Spear R5. If you do have this weapon with decent refinement, it packs quite a punch and has a really common team that satisfies the passive stacks with Zhongli and Qingqiu. Damage is significantly higher than the other 4-star options and is only 10% weaker than a vaporized R5 Dragon's Bane. This weapon, unfortunately, is pre-2.0 though, so newer players have zero access to this weapon. Overall though, the weapon choices are actually not that many for Hu Tang. Without the Battle Pass Deathmatch, hopefully you grab the Dragon's Bane somewhere since most of you will be running the vaporized composition. If not though, you may need to spend Star Glitter for the Black Cliff or settle with the White Tassel. Alright, next, 5-star weapons. So, three choices here, with the only one being a significant boost over the 4-star. Skyward Spine at R180. Demonstrating the power of this weapon on Hunta so you guys can see the comparison between the 4-star options. Next, Jade Spear at R180. The passive for this weapon will be mixed active. We'll be taking the highest damage numbers that we see. And for this weapon, I'll be using a crit damage mask because this weapon gives 20% crit rate at 80. And of course, Stab of Homa in both R180 and R594. I'll be testing both and demonstrating them both. Her signature weapon, here's how much stronger it is compared to everything else. So, four 5-star weapons, the Skyward Spine barely screeches out above 4-star weapon choices. Jade Spear is a decent option, but takes a bit of time to ramp up. The 70,000 burst damage that you saw was with the max passive active. Staff of Homa is coming out at 20% stronger than the other options at just R180. At R590, we see an additional 20-25% to damage gain on top of the R180 Homa. So, besides Staff of Homa being the obvious signature weapon choice for her, the Jade Spear still holds its ground slightly. But most likely, Hu Tao gamers will be pairing with Xing Chiu. The Dragon's Bane will likely be a more effective option than the Jade Spear. Besides that, take your pick, and if you're scarce on weapons, hopefully you have a White Tassel. So, besides that, take your pick, and if you're scarce on weapons, hopefully you have a White Tassel, or I guess Skyward Spine if you're running Last Resort weapons. Okay, up next, artifact recommendations for Hu Tao. Universally recommended 4-piece set, especially if running with Xing Chiu, Crimson Witch of Flames. Higher damage increase to 15%, as well as 15% increase to Vaporize and Melt damage. A 1-stack increase as well for 7.5% more power damage with the skill activation. That one's the obvious one. So for those that hate farming Crimson Witch pieces, the alternative 4-piece set, Shimanawa's Reminiscence. 
Stronger charge attacks, but an energy sacrifice to her burst. Depending on the play style, this can be a very heavy negative since her burst not only is her only true source of AoE, but it provides an emergency eject button in the form of an iframe plus heal. It's a 4P set that I would say requires a bit more attention from the player on energy management. It's a highly resin efficient set farmed with the emblem set, but potentially much more difficult to play around. Now besides that, super strong 2-piece options that are only slightly weaker than the 4-piece that we mentioned previously. 2-piece Crimson along with 2-piece Tenacity of the Millilith. The standard mix of 15% Pyro damage and 20% HP. And then we have the other 2-piece set, Wanderer's Troop 2-piece. It's a solid 80 elemental mastery boost, but must use with Xingqiu for vaporizes. I would not do Wanderer's Troop 2-piece if you're not running with Xingqiu at all. And then finally, last resort 2-piece options. For these, I would prioritize the sub stats and main stats over the set bonus. We have Noblesse for burst damage increase, Shimanawa's or Gladiator's 2-piece for the attack percent, and Emblem 2-piece for the recharge. So these 2-piece options provide very minimal DPS gain and are used as stepping stones for stronger options. Now for newer, pre-AR45 gamers, Berserker 4-piece is a very effective and easy set for her to use. Okay, jumping into main stat build, this is a standard HP DPS build, HP time piece, power damage goblet, and a crit rate or crit damage mask. For Hu Tao plus Xing Chou gamers, Elemental Mastery Timepiece is a great alternative, but be sure you can still maintain 30,000 HP without the HP Timepiece. This is strictly from substats and maybe her weapon. Her survivability is very important here. So for the Goblet, an HP Goblet is a suitable alternative if you don't have a satisfactory Pyro Damage Goblet, but the damage loss is pretty significant. So I'd advise you to switch ASAP even if the Pyro substats are poor. And for the mask, most players will run a crit rate mask, especially those who snatch up the staff of Homa. Players opting for a crit damage mask likely have a deathmatch Hutal, C6, or godly crit rate subset artifacts, or all of the above. Alright, now that we've covered the core of her build, let's draw by our constellations. Constellation 1. This constellation is the most well-known part of her kit, and what people generally aim for. Now that we've covered her playstyle, it's easy to see that C1 is her most powerful constellation. This is actually a change to my everything to prepare guide since I have since learned how to be a better Huta player. This constellation is more powerful the better you are at executing her DPS rotation. And even then, the fluidity of this constellation increases her ease of playstyle and stamina usage, which may not be increasing the numbers on the screen, but sure as hell makes you enjoy playing the character more. And that's what matters. So the PP state charge attack no stamina consumption allows you to switch to dash cancelling mechanics over jump cancelling mechanics without burning through your stamina. As mentioned before, be wary of the dash cooldown and it's still good to weave in jump cancels. No need for me to repeat info here, I'd recommend heading back to the playstyle section for a deeper dive on the effects of C1. The DPS increase is hard to put into numbers, but in general you'd expect a 15-20% to increase on top of fluid execution. Constellation 2. So, this is Blossom Bleed Damage now incorporates 10% of her max HP, which is affected by crit as well, and is now applied on her burst. So this roughly doubles her Blossom Damage, which is fairly significant, and extends her DPS to the off-field if applied on her AoE burst. You guys saw the damage output that was happening through my weapon comparisons. For her full rotation, this may account for about 5% of her DPS increase. C3, plus 3 levels to her skill scaling, more HP conversion, and Blossom Damage. Plus 3 levels is a 0.9% max HP conversion increase, so a 30k HP Hutao gains 270 attack from this constellation. 270 attack, depending on the type of build that you're running, can vary between 10% to 12% damage increase. C4, this is an extension of her Ascension 1 passive, providing party crit rate. This does not affect herself, so it's just a team buff. On top of her Ascension 1 though, this can build to a 24% crit rate buff to the team, which is very significant and noticeable team DPS increase. This is mostly info for C6 whales though. Constellation 5, plus 3 levels to burst, nothing to say here. Constellation 6, for my whales out there, C6 is the Trindamir passive for Hu Tao. Though it's mostly known for the fun 5% crit rate, 300% crit damage memes, this constellation is actually a super solid one given how easy it is to proc herself with her skill. Since her skill sacrifices 30% of her current HP every single time, getting below 25% HP or suffering lethal strike is actually fairly common. For general usage though, I would view this constellation as a quality of life feature that buffs you rather than one that you should build around. For example, still maintain a solid crit rate to crit damage ratio for general usage. You can go a little bit lower crit rate though. And then once this procs, whenever you drop below 25%, you get a steroid buff for 10 seconds. Okay, let's jump into team compositions. Uta, greedy main DPS, on field for 9 seconds or longer with hit lag extension and wants to spam her combos as much as possible. 
as internal cooldown ignore on her charge attack for vaporize and melt spam. So first up then, we have Hu Tang plus Xing Xiao. The strongest composition for Hu Tang with Xing Xiao as an off-field hydro enabler and the only consistent one able to keep up that hydro application so Hu Tao can abuse her ICD ignore charge attack. Two ways to build this comp further out. Chill with Zhongli. Fourth unit, if you have him Albedo for the additional sub DPS and his burst providing elemental mastery for the team for increased reaction damage. Any other sub DPS works here. This is a super safe composition with lots of survivability for Hu Tao to maintain her HP threshold below 50%. Second, double pyro with Kazawa or Sucrose as an Anemo enabler. Second, double pyro with Kazawa or Sucrose. A no shield comp so Hu Tao is more susceptible to damage and interruption. Higher DPS ceilings with Kazawa Sucrose buffing, either elemental damage bonus from Kazawa or elemental mastery transfer from Sucrose and Beer doesn't shred. Second Pyro is to apply Pyro for the Swirl since Hu Tao cannot effectively apply Pyro without activating her elemental skill and then she can't swap out. So for the second Pyro, Xiangling is dangerous since she can steal Vaporize with her Pyronado. Other potential Pyro enablers are Amber and Toma. Amber at C6 provides additional buff and if you have Elegy, she's a great user of that weapon here. Toma is great for additional survivability and micro shields to stop interruptions. Bennett I would not advise since the point of using Hu Tang is to save Bennett for your other team since she doesn't want to be healed above 50%. So this leads to a composition without Xing Xiu, Mono Pyro. Highly recommend Causal for this composition. Sucrose here is a lot more clunky but can fulfill this role at C6. If you run this comp in Abyss, most of the time your other half will be pure freeze. In that case, this composition is going to slam all the OP Pyro units into one composition. Hu Tang, Xiangling, Bennett, and Kazuha. It's okay to use Bennett here because again, this comp is incentivizing freeze on the other side. Bennett's detriment healing Hu Tang above 50% is compensated by his attack buff to both her and Xiangling. Melt viabilities if you don't have Xingqiu. Kaya and Rosaria for the consistent cryo application and Kazuha Sucrose to apply even more cryo. This is to attempt at maximizing her melt charge attacks. It's less consistent than the Xingqiu Vaporize comp, but it still works. And then Hyper Sub DPS Focus Composition. This is what supports Beidou, Xingqiu, and a flex pick. This one focuses on Hu Tao's on-field time combined with two super strong off-field DPS. Also assists with her AoE damage output courtesy of Beidou. Official C6 works wondrously here as the flex pick, or you can put a shielder like Diana or Zhongli. Finally, the nuke based composition. Usually, this will include Bennett, Kozla, and Mona for the obvious support buffs, but Mona can instead be a cryo applier instead for Hu Tao's melt procs. So overall, Hu Tao is actually pretty flexible to build around, mainly because her team does not require a healer. This allows the team to maximize DPS, add an emo crowd control, and or include shield, whatever you need. Alright, let's showcase some compositions. We'll drop by Abyss Floor 12 and demo some of the comps that I mentioned. I'll be playing around with both N2C Dash Cancel and N2C Jump Cancel. Cue the music, Mr. Cope. <laughs> Thank you. 
れでどうだそれでどうだよはにダメだ And with the showcase complete, that about wraps up the core of this guy. With extremely high single target damage potential and ceiling for skill expression, Hu Tang excels at maximizing reaction based damage with her ICD ignoring charge attack. Investing both resources and mechanics will prove very fruitful for Hu Tang, and she'll definitely appreciate it with those cute idol animations. If this guy can help you understand Hu Tang a little better, consider liking the video and subscribing to the YouTube channel for more similar content. It's free, and I'd really appreciate it. I also stream nearly every day on my Twitch channel, so if you're interested, check out the link in the description. Thanks for watching, and I wish that everyone's still trying to pull Huta the best of luck. We'll see you in the next one. Take care.